morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today for the distribution of cultural lack scale use in the arid Southwest with Dr. Marilyn Poole. I'm Maggie Onis Organ, the public program man manager here at the Ameren Museum. And before we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge that the Ameren is located in Southern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Hopi, Oshwi, Yoeme, and Apache families have lived for untold generations and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all of these communities rich in history have to teach us. We would also like to thank all our members and donors who enable the Ameren to provide this free online programming and fulfill Ameren's mission to foster and promote the knowledge and understanding of the native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist the Ameren in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit ameren.org. Please also join us on Saturday, September 30th, as Dr. Giselle Ramon Sabarin, who is Thana Otham from the San Javier District. She will be speaking on caretakers of the land, history and water in the San Javier community. Also on Saturday, October 28th, we will be talking to Dr. Millicent Michelle Pepion, who will be speaking on Arizona's creation story, important treaties and executive orders regarding the Native Nations and the Arizona Territory from 1846 to 1912. To register or for more information on these and other events, please go to our events page on our website. If you would like to ask any questions today, um, please type your questions in the Q&A chat box and I will gather those questions to share with Dr. Poole after her presentation. Also a link to the recording of today's program will be sent to all our registrants and available to watch on our YouTube channel. Um, today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Marilyn Poole here with us today to share her knowledge with us. Um, Dr. Poole is a senior project conservator at the Arizona State Museum and objects conservator and owner of Sonoran Art Conservation Services in Tucson. Among all that, she earned her doctorate degree in Arid Lands Resource Sciences at the University of Arizona. She has a graduate degree in Museum Studies from Oregon State University and is a graduate of the Sir Sanford Fleming Art Conservation Program in Ontario, Canada. Today, she will be speaking on the subject of her dissertation. So now please help me welcome Dr. Marilyn Poole. Uh, thank you to the Ameren Museum for the invitation to speak today, and thank you all for coming to this online presentation. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from my home, which resides on a Hoakam village. Tucson is the ancestral home to many peoples, including the Hoakam, the Atom, and Yaqui, and I seek to honor their histories and traditions today. I'm going to start by describing the background of my research on lack scale uh, insects in the Southwest and their ecological distribution for context. Then I'll describe the cultural use of lack through time, including discussion of the Comcock or Seri traditional knowledge of lack. And next I'll explain how lack found in museum collections can be identified and verified, followed by some conclusions. So colleagues at the Arizona State Museum conducted a survey of Southwest pottery in the early 2000s that revealed the use of insect lac as a mending adhesive and sealant for jars for food storage. And a later survey of the archeological perishable collections also at the Arizona State Museum revealed evident, evidence of resinous adhesives in those artifacts. The results of the preliminary analysis of the resins found in the perishables are shown in this chart. Out of 143 artifacts sampled, 36% or 31 artifacts with resins positively identified as insect lac, but only one of those was properly identified as such in the catalog records. So that revealed that there was an identification problem. <laughs> Uh, lack is often unidentified or misidentified in collections and in the anthropological literature contributing to its ongoing obscurity. 
Examples of that are shown here with on the left, uh, herbarium specimen of creosote bush or Larea tridentata with lac or Tacardiella larei on the stem, but it's not identified as at all. And in the middle, the same material, creosote bush with lac, as part of an ethnographic collection, it's called a plant gum. And then on the right, a wallopi rattle made with what is probably insect lac, but there's no mention of adhesive at all in the catalog record. So what is lac, you might wonder. <laughs> uh, lac is the hard exudate containing resins, pigments, and waxes from the scale insects in the Caridae family. And adult lac scales attached to woody plant stems become immobile and feed on the plant's phloem, which is essentially a sugar water. And lac scales are the only resin producing animals on the planet. The Caridae family consists of 10 genera, uh, 101 species of which uh, are currently known worldwide. And one of those genera is the Tacardiella, of, uh, <clears throat> which contains 17 known species that live in the United States, Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. Seven of those species live in the arid Southwest, and three of those seven are known to have cultural use, and those are the fo focus of this study. So each of these three species has a primary host plant. Each is a slightly different color, and these three specimens on the left uh, I found in the U of A herbarium collections and the insects weren't uh, cataloged at all. It was just the plant specimens they were interested in. So the top, Tacardiella larei, uh, lives on creosote bush, also Larea tridentata, and is a bright red color. And the middle is Tacardiella fulgens, which lives on Corsetia glandulosa, or ro rosary baby bonnets, and is a bright orange color. And Tacardiella pustulata, lives on Pluchia cerisia or arrowweed bush and is a kind of a dark maroon color. And all three of these host plants are, and insects are found at various elevations, but all within the basin and range biome and in our deserts. So <clears throat> in the 1940s, the first distribution of the Tacardiella, in this case, Tacardiella larei, um, was studied by Dr. Harold Colton, the founder of the Museum of Northern Arizona and an entomologist. And he was interested in exploring the potential to commercially produce lac out of Arizona to supplement the loss of Asian lac supply during World War II. He documented Cardiella larei as shown in the map on the right, but did find that it was not commercially viable. Um, <clears throat> the greatest concentrations were found along the Colorado River in the Kingman area and Yuma area and then the Sacramento Valley in California. And the photograph is of Dr. Colton and his wife seated with a museum employee standing with boxes of lac they collected in the field. And so this table shows the different sources I used to try to update to Cardiola distribution and the number of specimens I found from each source type, ranging from entomology collections, herbaria specimens with lac, anthropological collections with lac, and then my own and colleague observations out in the field and observations from iNaturalist members. And iNaturalist is a uh, crowdsourcing network founded in 2008 for recording biological specimens in the field. And the chart on the right shows the observations to date of just two of the three uh, species with Lorea completely dominating. And then those observances are shown in this map, which is much broader distribution than the original Colton study. Uh-oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And uh, this chart shows the number of observances by uh, different states with California dominating at 50% and Arizona second at 24%. So <clears throat> um, 
This table shows the number of specimens of each species found by desert and states within. And then these two images are of raw lac on creosote bush and a knife probably also made with lac, both collected by Ma uh, Major John Wesley Powell in 1874 during his, some of his Colorado River expeditions. And so the discovery of raw lac material and lac used in artifacts, both collected by the same people, um, extended known distribution into Utah and further areas of other known source states. So that takes us to the distribution of cultural lac scale use and a brief overview of the methodology I had to use um, pre-COVID and during COVID to gather my data. Um, fortunately, I was able to examine collections in person and conduct analysis in Tucson at the Arizona State Museum, at the Park Service and the Ameren Museum. And then I did two uh, pretty broad road trips through, through the Southwest in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, and Utah, where I was able to use photography and UV light examination when possible. I also conducted uh, archival research of field notes, documents, and photographs. And then once the pandemic made in-person um, examination impossible, I consulted online collection databases, which were pretty extensive. And I was able to examine catalog records, photography, and then consult anthropological literature to back up what I was seeing. And on the bottom are, is an example of that. This is a basket making all collected by uh, Dr. Carl Lumholtz at San Javier Mission that the museum catalog identifies as being made with pitch question mark. And yet Len Holtz's own uh, book about his travels identify basket making alls he was collecting as being made from scale insects and even describes the, the process that they'd be ground up and heated on pottery over fire and molded to shape. So this is an example of how I was able to use the literature to fill in either um, misidentification of material or just gaps. And so <clears throat> this map shows a broad overview of the kinds of objects that had survived from all the different uh, cultural groups in the Southwest region in this era. And I'll provide more details of these types of objects and the culture groups in upcoming slides. So in the northernmost region, part of the region, in southern Utah and northern Arizona, New Mexico, the earliest archaic and basket maker sites are shown. Some of these are shown here on the map where uh, lac containing objects were found. The oldest possible um, object, I haven't been able to analyze the material yet, but if I can and prove it's lac, um, this point, projectile point on top came, is from the late archaic and came from Cowboy Cave in Utah. Uh, this um, knife here is from the Arizona State Museum where I was able to verify it as lac and it's from Broken Flute Cave dating to from 354 to 652 current era. And then other types besides weapons and tools, these uh, gaming pieces made of bone were backed with um, lac from these from the Marsh Pass, Pass region in Basket Maker 2. And then moving into the ancestral Puebloan era, um, note the very broad distribution from Las Vegas, Nevada area, all the way to Pueblo Benito site in uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Uh, these show the continued use of lac for uh, making weapons and tools, hafting, and this example here on the bottom left is the same object shown in daylight and ultraviolet light um, uh, displaying the, the uh, fluorescence that lac has under the right conditions as a diagnostic tool. And then the backsides of these bone gaming pieces showing how lac was applied to them. And then starting to see uh, kind of more ornamental and composite objects 
as with these inlaid shell pieces from Edge of the Cedar and a scraper from Pueblo Benito at Chaco with a stone, turquoise, and shell inlay on bone using lac as a mastic. And then now into the western part of the region with the Patayan sites, upper and lower, the continued production of tools and blades. In this case, this is a large knife and this lac is actually a, a big wad as a handle for the knife. And then this would have been an adhesive for hafting. And then the lower Patayan um, is the first use we see of the lac as a pottery repair as shown here and as a sealant around the rim of this jar used for um, preservation of seeds and other foodstuffs. And then in North Central Arizona with the Sanaguan sites shown here, um, this is a uh, lac was used almost solely so far that I've been able to find as a mosaic lastic, uh, mastic. And the artifacts were excavated in 1939 at Ridge Ruin, here east of uh, Flagstaff, where raw lac, stick lac, mosaics, ornaments, and stone points were all identified as being made with lac from samples that were sent to Dr. Volney Jones, a botanist at the University of Michigan, where he used microchemical tests to verify it. And that material was all published in this report shown here, which was the first published use of archeological use of lac in the Southwest. And this is my copy that was previously owned by Neil Judd. So that was a score. <laughs> and then these are examples of some of the mosaics from the Sanaguan sites where lac is the, the underlying mastic as shown here where it's, there's been loss. And then now moving further south in the region uh, to Hoacom and Salado sites. Uh, these objects here on the right are all from the Hoacom. And <clears throat> again, showing the ultraviolet light versus daylight. This is a insect lac used as a resist for etch shell. In this case from Hodges ruin in the Tucson area. And then in the middle, the use of lac is a coating for uh, what I assume is kicking balls. They were typically used as kicking balls in the historic era. Um, in this case, uh, x-ray image revealed that core was definitely bone and, um, as, and others uh, had stone and wood cores. This is an example on the right of x-ray showed this is actually solid lac without any core. And this was found in the Gila River area with these two shells. And so perhaps it was going to be used for shell etching as above. And then the, on the bottom, this uh, pottery repair and this small ball of lac were both from Ventana Canyon. This small little ball may have been included in a pouch, say for arrow making as shown here on the right. And this was the one object from the Arizona Museum that was properly identified as lac by Emil Cowery, of course. And then these two arrows hafted with lac are from uh, Casas Grande ruins and Tanca Verde Cave. And then the Salado continued use of lac for mosaic and uh, along the bottom for shell inlay. And then uh, pottery repair on this jar. And these three were from the Los Muertos site and the two mosaic pieces from uh, Tonto Cliff, Cliff Dwellings. And now for the Mugion, uh, continued use of lac as a mastic for mosaic work, these two pieces from Kanishba. And then um, this is of interest, the, the Mugion were actually using both pine resin and insect lac. Uh, the pine resin for the tenon joint, which could be twisted and easily removed and then hafting with uh, insect lac to make sure the, the arrowhead was permanently attached. So the lac is still present here, even though the arrowhead broke off. And this is another example of that. And then on the right, continued use of lac as a 
hafting for this somewhat charred um, biface. And then on the lower picture is a knife probably hafted with lac. Wasn't able to examine it since it's now in Austin. But um, this is from the Hornada Mugion from Northwest Texas. So to summarize the archeological collections research, I was able to identify 124 manufactured objects with lac from 18 different culture groups with the ancestral Puebloan, Hoacom, and Mugion having the greatest number of objects. And then on the right, um, this is a list of some of the prior research of uh, the cultural use of Tacardiella lorei that formed a foundation for my research. The uh, Red Ruin study and Colton's Lack distribution study I've already mentioned. And then in the 1950s, Euler and Jones wrote an article on the use of lack for hermetic sealing of pottery jars. And then in the 1990s, uh, these authors investigated the chemical characterization of lac, as well as the cultural use in the Great Basin. And then finally, uh, the last article on or chapter on the cultural use of creosote lac for ethnographic pottery repair that came out of the Arizona State Museum study. Which leads us to the ethnographic cultural distribution and use of lac. Again, this overview map, which I'll um, segregate into five geographical subgroups and describe more about the kinds of artifacts that were have been made in the historic era. Also note um, the, the uh, retraction of the geography compared to the archaeological era. So the first subgroup um, or subregion, I should say, is the upper Colorado River and Mojave Desert with people, peoples living in Southern Nevada, Eastern Central California, Northwest Arizona and Southwest Utah. These top three objects uh, from the Shema Huevi were all collected by Isabel Kelly and she identified them all as being made with lac and all a rattle and this uh, mixture of lac and paint used to decorate arrows. And then uh, the, on the lower left, uh, Havasupai jar that was possibly repaired with lac along the, the upper shoulder. And again, the Hualapai rattle that's probably made with lac um, from the Hualapai. And in the same uh, subregion, the Moapa, Shivwitz, and Kaibab bands of Southern Paiute were all using lac, which had been previously unknown in Utah. And these three upper uh, artifacts were all collected again by J.W. Powell on his Colorado River expeditions. And again, really helpful that he collected raw stick lac here from the creosote bush, as well as a jar with lac as a, a sealant and, and hafted knives. And then another collector uh, sent around the Southwest by Harvard and other institutions, uh, Dr. Edward Palmer, a botanist, collected this um, application stick with lac on the end, and he called it gum of Sarea Mexicana, but it's very likely Tacardiella um, lorei from the Lorea tridentata. A lot of the nomenclature changed over time. Um, botanical and insect. And then the second subregion is the lower Colorado River with peoples living in southwest Arizona and southeastern California. Again, the production of rattles with lac here from the Cumie and Mojave, and a seed jar from the Mojave with a repair of lac, and again with the sealant around the rim for food storage. And this is an example of um, heated, processed and heated lac for transport. And uh, the collector describes it as being used to mend pottery and as a cement, but also a septic. And I'll talk a little more about medicinal uses in a few slides. Um, and then this is an example of the arrowweed gum, quote unquote, collected by Dr. Palmer, or uh, Tacardiella pustulata, collected from the Cocopa people. 
And Gifford, another anthropologist, described this arrowweed gum as being ground with a matate mixed with water and applied as glue for pottery repair and, and rattle making. So again, an example of how the anthropological literature filled in some of the gaps from the museum records. And now the third subregion, the Sonoran Desert and Lower Inland River Valleys, uh, peoples living in South Central or Arizona, we see the continued use of lac as a ball coating from the prehistoric era. In this case, a stone, stone and wood cores. And in this, these two balls, uh, shell and turquoise inlay, and another basket weaving all in the middle with a lac handle an arrow uh, hafted with lac from the pipash and a rattle identified as being made with arrowweed gum from the Yale Peabody. And from the Tohono O'odham, again, the, the convenience or <laughs> of the collector of objects also collecting raw material, in this case, the uh, Tacardiella lorei from creosote bush and a applicator stick, in this case collected by Julian Hayden with a swarrow stem. And you can imagine something like this being used heated and applying this kind of a smear repair for a crack on this pot and as a plug repair in two places on this pot. And then again for rattles and basket making awls. And now moving into Chihuahua, Mexico, the Tarahumara people are the only group known so far who eat lac as a food. And it's actually prepared as a condiment called ari, shown here being mixed and ground with chili tupin and sprinkled on top of food like we would salt or pepper or garlic powder or something. And um, here on the left is a raw piece of stick lac, in this case, Tacardiella fulgens collected in the Barrancas in the 1890s from the Tahramara and processed lac in this kind of a roll um, called an aphid secretion by Carl Lumholtz. And the same kind of thing shown here content from contemporary Mercados. Um, these are called, it's the same material, the heated and rolled lac and called masos. And an example of a jar that's repaired with lac and pine resin and wood and wire and rope, they really wanted this to hold. I think it's a Tesquino jar and it's quite large. And then for the state of Sonora, I wasn't able to find too much, um, too many artifacts. Um, I was able to find in the collections, various collections, uh, a Pima Bajo rattle and a Yaqui rattle made with lac. But um, authors here, uh, Yetman and Bandavender, described the Mayo as using lac for medicinal uses, in this case, Tricardiola fulgens, which was mixed with water, cinnamon, and mistletoe, and used to treat children for diarrhea. And this image uh, shows an example of lac being sold as goma de sonora, also for diarrhea and dysentery. And I did through the literature, I found several examples of uh, early missionaries describing Goma de Sonora as being very useful for treating uh, bug bites and snake bites. And then in later years, um, as with the contemporary uses for gastrointestinal pro problems. So it was very much considered a medicinal. And even there were, um, sources that talked about it being sold in Tucson in pharmacias for the same for gastrointestinal problems up to the 1920s. So to summarize the ethnographic collections research, I was able to find 212 manufactured objects with lac and rattles um, being very the most common um, were made by 14 of the 20 different cultural groups in very broad distribution from the upper Colorado to Sonoran Chihuahua. And the most lac containing objects were made by the Seri, Tohono O'odham, Mojave, Akama O'odham, and Southern Paiute. Um, 
notable is that Lack was featured in Autumn Creation Stories as the very first insect created and as glue to seal up a huge jar for the survival of floods, which contributed to the idea that this material was more than just utilitarian, it had importance, it had significance culturally. Which ties in with my interest in the traditional knowledge aspect of lack relating to cultural in, um, significance with the seri or comcock and tradition and general traditional knowledge of what they call zipsk. And uh, traditional ecological knowledge is the culmination of knowledge, practice, and beliefs about relationships between people and all living beings and their landscapes, culturally transmitted through generations. Material culture is one manifestation of traditional knowledge to document continuity, as well as changes in Comcock culture, as shown in this chart where a wide variety of object types with lack are shown, but carvings, uh, the ironwood carvings for tourism are the most numerous compared to the more subsistence. And that may just be a function of the ease of collecting these materials, the, the tourist trade objects. So Comcock language or Seri language is extant and retains traditional knowledge, in, including on lack use. And thanks to the Spanish English um, Seri dictionary produced by Moser and Marlott, we have access to not only specific terms about lack, but phrases relating to lack use. So these phrases all relate to the use of lack for hermetic sealing. And this is an example of a jar at the Arizona State Museum where the lack is still present in the um, lid is still attached. And these are the kind of the same, but in situ on one of the probably Isla Tiburon. And then these two jars, um, very large painted jars, both had lac sealant. Um, these are from the amaranth. And uh, the one on the lower right was found filled with cardone seeds, which is another giant cactus, a um, little bit like the swaro, but from, from Sonora. And then the, <clears throat> the, this phrase relates to the use of lack for making an arrow as shown here. And in this catalog card from the Amarind, it, uh, they were described as being made with hawk feathers, deer sinew and lack from the creosote bush. And on the right, a term for gluing something with lack, uh, in this case, a harpoon point for turtle fishing. And on the lower, left um, a term for lack made amulets which were kind of quasi spiritual medicinal objects that probably went out of production in the 1950s and then the most uh, recent use of lack was as a fill shown here fluorescing um, a fill for the cracks and gaps in ironwood used to make these figures the commonly known figures so the knowledge of lack insect expressed in nomenclature and classification in the Seri language is an expression of the relationships between the people and the insects. The study of that local knowledge is the foundation of ethnobiology. So to summarize the overall cultural distribution and knowledge of lack use over place and time, objects that disappeared or became rare in the historic era were the prestige items like the etched shell, mosaic, and stone inlay pieces, and the gaming pieces and dice with inlaid lac, and half, uh, knives hafted with lac became increasingly rare in the historic period. But other objects shown in this table had continuity over time well into the historic era with uh, lac uses a hafting adhesive for arrows, for handles, for awls, basket making awls, coatings for balls, kicking balls, in some cases hafting for knives, and pottery repairs and pottery sealants. And now I'm going to discuss the um, some of the techniques for 
material characterization for verifying insect lack found in museum collections. Verification of lack exudate found in museum collections through physical and chemical analysis can correct mistaken identification from the past, bringing cultural lack use out of obscurity. The physical and chemical attributes of lack used in cultural material can facilitate understanding of the manufacturing techniques. Understanding how those attributes behave over time with different environmental conditions can help determine the best protocols for long-term preservation in a museum context. And this table provides a summary of the different methods and equipment I used, which I'll detail, uh, describe in more detail now. So there's two types of non-destructive analysis I used. Um, microscopy, and in my case, digital microscopy as shown here with a dynolite and ultraviolet light as shown with this uh, long wave um, UV light for examination. And these images show what LAC looks like where it's a diagnostic positive with UV light, this nice bright orange color. Um, the positive of these techniques is that no sampling is required and it's portable, they're portable and inexpensive. The negatives is you don't always get this nice bright orange. <laughs> um, sometimes it's, and even then it can be very subjective as to what's orange or green or different uh, fluorescence colors of different materials. So determination isn't always clear and sometimes it's just inaccurate. And that's especially the case with archaeological material where there's a lot of uh, degradation or soiling where it can be very difficult to distinguish, say, between lac and pine resin. So when that's the case, we turn to destructive analysis where sampling is required. Um, cultural heritage is a non-renewable resource, and if allowed, sampling should be minimal with very small samples, one to two millimeters extracted for these techniques. Microchemical tests um, examine the reactions between these small particles taken and other chemical agents. So this shown here is a positive reaction for lac using sodium hydroxide as a spot test. The uh, spot tests, again, the positives is they can be used in the field, they're inexpensive, and they can verify results from the non-destructive techniques like microscopy and uh, UV light. The very first chemical analyses of Tacardiella lorei were microchemical tests on samples from Colton's distribution study. And the results of that um, were compared with the same tests on Caria laca, which is a species of lac that grows in Asia. And you've probably know commonly as shellac. Um, the, the difference in their properties is, as you can see, the, the Asian lac is very, very high in resin and very low in wax, which is why it makes a great varnish or coating like on your furniture or musical instruments. And the Tacardiella lorei is very low in resin and very high in wax, which is why it's a terrible resin and an excellent adhesive for joining. And they're pretty comparable in terms of pigment content and other materials. And the reason the, it's common sense that the desert species would be high in wax because the wax help protect the insects from our hot and arid climate. And so two other techniques I used this time to compare two species of raw lac that I collected, uh, Tacardiella fulgens from the Tucson area and Tacardiella lorei from the Ajo area. One is uh, Fourier transform infrared spectrometry or FTIR, which shows the absorption bands of functional groups, identifying the material as a complete form. So both the fulgens and lorei are identifiable as lac, but you wouldn't necessarily know which was which. They're pretty similar in terms of their bands and peaks. Whereas gas chromatography, mass spectrometry or GCMS, 
shows all the building blocks of a sample, all of the chemical compounds of which they're composed. So these results, these chromatograms of the two species are quite different. And the results shown here, the Lorette um, revealed 141 specific compounds and Fulgens 112. But out of all of those, only seven between the two were found in common. Um, shown here, indicating how complex uh, chemical matrices, matrices these lack materials are. So even though patterns were observed in comparing the two fresh samples, I couldn't really draw any conclusions and um, more uh, future analysis with different technology will be required to, to figure out what was going on there. And I'd love to be able to find samples of the pustulata to include also. And then, but the positive is that the number of compounds defined of these two species are much greater than previously found. And this is the first time uh, the two species have been compared. Uh, previous GCMS um, studies had only been done on uh, Lorei. And so some conclusions from this research is I was able to document further evidence of the cultural use of Tacardiella fulgens and Pustulata as well as Lorei. I expounded the known boundaries of the ecological distribution and cultural use of Tacardiella, the three Tacardiella species to Southern Nevada, Southern Utah, Northwest Texas, and further into Southern California. Their traditional knowledge of lack embedded in autumn creation stories and in the Comcock language illuminate the cultural significance of lack in the arid Southwest. And lack exchange routes likely included the shorter distances across the Northern era areas, as with the discovery of lack in Utah and Nevada, not only long distance routes from South to North as previously believed, Methods for analysis of LAC used in cultural heritage have been described to facilitate the verification of the material found in museum collections. And finally, revival and expansion of previous studies, this research provided a foundation for further exploration, bringing to Cardiella and its cultural use out of obscurity. And these are selected references, which you probably can't read, but they should be, um, they're gonna be sent out to you in an email along with the link to the YouTube. And it's just a, a small selection, but it'll give a good background if you are interested. And finally, to acknowledge um, the funding sources that help my dissertation research and the members of my dissertation committee and the many people from institutions uh, who helped facilitate my research and analysis at the U of A and elsewhere, including the Ameren Museum. And special thanks to fellow LAC enthusiasts who helped continue, did and continue inspire me to continue this research. And finally, to my mom and my brother for their encouragement. And that is it. So I'll close. You've got some questions, so let me. Okay. Should I go back to full view? Um, sure. Or leave it on this. Okay, I'll end the show. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So one from Lynn. How is lack excluded, exuded from the insect? Is it a waste product, a protective coating? It's um, it's a waste product. It's poop. <laughs> but it's also a protective coating. Um, it's once the the female um, sticks her proboscis into the stem and she loses all her limbs and basically fills with eggs as she drinks the the phloem from the plant. And then once she's uh, those eggs become gravid over it's they in the Southwest, these Tacardiella produce once a year. And so she starts exuding as a waste product, but also a coating, this lac that then provides protection for the hatchlings, which 
are very delectable to many, many predator insects. And one from Alan, are there no vis visual characteristics of black, pitch, and other indigenous adhesives that can be used to identify each of them through macroscopic observation other than dino light or UV light? Um, when it's really fresh, it can be uh, distinguished from pitch. I mean, the, the pitch resin is quite um, reflective. And um, if this is Alan Ferg, you know what I'm talking about, pitch baskets. <laughs> They're, it's shiny and the lack is quite dull in appearance. That one, uh, the, the pot with the three red streaks as an adhesive or in the wall of pots of, at ASM and you can see how red they are. That to me is an indicator of lack that probably wasn't heated all that hot. So the red color shows through and it's probably from the creosote lack. But in most cases, especially things like arrows where it's really concealed, it's pretty hard to, you have to do more diagnostic analysis um, to determine whether it's pitch or lack. And also the mosaics because they're hidden. Someone asking if you had a picture of the insect. Yeah, um, it, I had pictures of them in the beginning slide. I mean, the ins I actually have a video of them hatching, <laughs> but it's not in here. But if I, if I reshare this, let's see, I have to wait. I have to reshare. So, and now presenter view. So can you see this slide? These are pictures of the insects. So these are a lot, can, if you can see my mouse pointer, the ones on the far right are Tacardiella fulgens hatching and you can see they're kind of orange. And then next to it, the one with the ant, those are Tacardiella lorei being tended by an ant and the ants actually are guardians for the lac scale. They get benefit from the, the mother who produces not only lac, but honeydew or sugar water. And uh, they feed on that and then they go and attack wasps and other predators. So it's a, a, a beneficial relationship. I have a question from Sherry. Lac was widely used in Asia and Western Asia as a source of a red dye for textiles. Is there any right. evidence that it was used in the American Southwest as a textile dye? Is um, the American lac too sticky to be used as dye? No, there's. it has the same kind of dyes. And as I showed in earlier slides, the three colors, um, a friend of mine, Christina Basilka, who's a conservation scientist has been trying to uh, study the different dye chemicals from the Western lac. Um, there's no evidence of it being used to date. We see Asian lac used in say wolf or Navajo rugs, but um, so far I haven't identified it like we did cochineal in the archeological Southwest textiles. Um, I think it's the you know the knowledge of cochineal as a dye goes far back into antiquity i just i think this material was understood as an adhesive and it really uh it i don't think it was pursued as a dye although it is there it does they all have dye components i just one from, it. sorry go ahead one from Henry, any ideas as to how these uses were originally discovered? Amazing use of natural resources. Well, I think uh, like most things, trial and error, but given that the earliest objects we've been able to find were weapons and tools, they probably, I don't know, through, because once you wouldn't know just looking at it on the bush, and now I finally have been able to find it in the wild. You wouldn't think it's very hard. It's, it really is like hard plastic in its raw form. 
But if some creosote bush, for example, was used for so many medicinal purposes and multiple uses, and if they had lac and they put it in a fire and saw this stuff melt and then felt how sticky it was is just a guess as to how it was determined to be a viable adhesive. Because then as soon as it's out of the heat, it hardens immediately. It's um, completely thermoplastic. So, and that's why it lasts. There's a, what's called taphonomic bias where because of the properties of this material being, it's really a polygamer of um, polyester and wax is it has incredible lasting power, thousands of years. Whereas something like pine resin oxidizes and ages more quickly with heat and ultraviolet light and crumbles off as with people have probably seen with old pitch baskets. So this material actually crosslinks chemically and becomes stronger with time and lasts. The one from Libby. Ed Milia, Milia, Milia's The Butterfly Effect discussed the importance of lax, lac ex, exudate for red coloration and the domestication of lac insects for this purpose by pre-contact native cultures in South America. Did you discover evidence of domestication in your studies? Not yet, um, not like cochineal, and I've been looking. <laughs> um, the, well, I should take that back. There is evidence, um, according to Robert Bai, an ethnobiologist who did extensive research with the Tarahumara, that they were propagating lac at the lower elevations of the Barrancas to trade with the, with the Tarahumara living on the upper elevations who were growing corn, and so trading lac for food. And, and then also it would be taken to Mercado um, from up top for sale or trade with other materials. So the Tarahumara were uh, most likely propagating this material in, um, in the Barrancas. I haven't found evidence from other people, but um, Colton actually did a propagation study uh, the same way that cochineal is propagated, taking uh, live animals and putting them in little baskets or attaching them, growing them on their sticks and attaching those with dental floss, basically, to other plants and seeing if they would take. Uh, that's, you know, with the Opuntia cactus, that's how cochineal is propagated. And um, he did have some success, except he said the ants or it would um, bite through the dental floss and knock the pieces off thinking they were a threat, <laughs> which shows how good those little ants were, what good guards they were. So I've tried, I've tried and have not succeeded. So future research. <laughs> Other project. So this is Jen and she's thrilled to see this. Did you say that these creatures are the only producing creatures on the planet? only resin producing creatures on the planet, animals, yep. So they're pretty neat. Yeah, and Paulina, does climate change have an impact on the insects, plants, et cetera, on the lack? Yeah, I think it will, especially um, the, the pustulata, which grows on arrowweed, which requires water. They're usually found, those plants have been found uh, along the Gila River and the Colorado River. And unfortunately, a lot of um, the arrowweed was torn up for the border wall along the, in the Cocopa region. I think those water-based plants are definitely gonna be impacted. And creosote bush seems to live forever, but the insects may not. And, and it's actually, even though the creosote bush plant is everywhere in our desert, it's actually quite hard to find the lat growing. It has very specific requirements, which is another study I'd love to do, is figure out what, what are the actual requirements in terms of temperature and elevation. The Tacardiella fulgens likes to grow in very specific um, little canyons. So in the Tucson region, it can be found basically only in Kings Canyon and Sabino Canyon. There are a few other sites it grows much more broadly in Sonora, Mexico, where it's a little wetter, um, in wetter parts of Sonora, Mexico. 
but it's that one I worry about too because um, it tends it has very specific uh, requirements that I think if anything survives, it'll be the ones on the creosote. This kind of answered part of that, but Jonathan asked, have any tips for finding samples of creosote lack in the wild? Yeah, knowing where to look. <laughs> I, I looked for um, six years <laughs> just by going where I knew lack had been collected in the past based on entomology specimens. And then it really was until that iNaturalist, I came across the iNaturalist feature where somebody found some in Ajo and gave me the GPS reading <laughs> so I could, and it killed me because I'd actually been to that exact spot before in the past <laughs> and just didn't notice it. So um, it's, yeah, you have to kind of, you can look up on the iNaturalist site and you can see a recording of where I found it and go there, but please be observe and don't take because it is um, becoming more rare. So it's, yeah, you, I mean, creosote is everywhere, as I said, but there are only very specific places where it likes to be. And there's some spots kind of near the Arizona, New Mexico border and um, really more out towards Ajo and then definitely on the autumn reservation lands, but you can't collect there. So you can observe and take pictures and check it out, but it really shouldn't be collected. So are the Otham still using it culturally today? Um, possibly. Um, it's just as with everything, everything, you know, anybody who can get a hold of super glue or, or whatever glue is more likely to use that as an adhesive, but it may still be used culturally. Um, it may still be used for, for making things like ceremonial objects, like rattles. Um, there are people who are revitalizing the use of lac for shell um, up in the Gila River area, revitalizing the use of lac for shell resist for etched shell and as mosaic inlay, kind of more as art pieces. But broadly, um, I found in conversations with people some knowledge of its use, uh, but really nothing um, like not for pottery repair or, and but alls. Most alls you see today are made of wood for basket making. This kind of goes into the next question from Dave. Was lac the only material used as a resist for etching shell? As far as we know, um, I don't think, I, I actually took a class with Alan Denoye on shell etching and boy, it's hard. <laughs> we ended it, we actually used wax uh, to make it work. And I'm still trying to figure out how lac was used in that way because it does, as soon as you, it's out of the heat, it immediately hardens. So to be able to, to work it onto a shell in a pattern. The only thing I could think is that it would be heated and the shell would be heated and you had to work really fast. And same with the mosaic work. Like I was investigating whether it could have been mixed with uh, beeswax or clay to make it a little uh, more malleable because the idea of fitting in tiny little tessera of turquoise into this material that wants to become rock hard as soon as it's not hot. I still haven't figured that out, but um, I don't, that piece from the Hodges ruin was a clear indicator. It's definitely lac and it's been documented as lac and that the etched shell stopped being made, I think after the pioneer period. So um, yeah, it's just a matter of um, having to find materials on shell like that lac to see if there was anything else being used, possibly beeswax, but I don't know. So here's two that kind of go together. Um, was it traded with Northeastern natives? And then the second, have you found any evidence of trade in lack? Yes, well, that uh, Colton was interested. Colton and McGregor were all thinking that lack was, it was, wouldn't have been possible to find it up North. They had no idea it was in Utah or Nevada and assumed it was all being traded from the Sonoran Desert up 
steps above the Magian room. Um, there's no evidence I know of, of lack being present at all out of the Southwest. I mean, other than in South America, there are other lack in, other insects down there, but I, I really focus just on our region, the Arabs, Northern Mexico and, and the South American Southwest. Um, the adhesives used in the Northeast were uh, more often made of things like birch bark tar, and hide glue and uh, fish glue. So they, um, and, process, and pine where it was available, tree resins. So I don't know of any evidence of it being traded out of our region. The, as I said, Colton and earlier anthropologists all made assumptions about it being traded north south, but I came across a reference of I believe it was Whiting, if I remember correctly, writing about the um, a trade route between the, I think Havasupai and the Hopi, and that the lack was actually coming from California to Supai, and then being trade hiked over to Hopi and traded for Hopi blankets. And so there was kind of a whole trade network with foodstuffs and a lot of times gourds were being traded in to make rattles and then lack going back. So it was really more like a California across the Grand Canyon to Hopi region. Um, and clearly it was making it to Chaco in the prehistoric period. And I don't know what that trade route would have been. But I noticed on there's the no evidence of it growing in New Mexico other than in the south southern part, like um, Silver City region and further south. Yeah. I noticed on that original map a couple of sites in the Baja area of California on the coast. Would yeah, be... it's still there. It's still that's the fulgens. Um, Tacardiella fulgens is still being is still grown, still grows in Baja and Baja Sur. And that's why you see um, a combination of, depending on access to asphalt, because a lot of the coastal tribes were making their rattles with the stuff that sticks to your feet at the beach, <laughs> you know, tar, asphalt, and then also lac, if that was more accessible, so. And it held up to that kind of coastal climate? Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't, it didn't so much, it grew more, like along the Colorado River. And then it does grow right in um, the lower tip of Baja Sur, close to the coast. So, but that's the Tricardiella fulgens, which is more adapted to kind of a canyon lands than just flatland desert and a little higher elevation. And probably the last question from Alan, might mesquite sap also have been used as the resist material for shell etching? No, because it's water soluble. So um, mesquite was used as a, a paint and a dye and as a glue, but it, it nothing that could get wet. And so the shell etching problem, process is a wet process. It has to be um, put into an acid to eat the shell. And so mesquite would have just dissolved completely. And that's why it's, it's a gum, it's a plant gum, and it makes um, a great like watercolor base, but not, not a resist that had to get wet or any kind of durable adhesive. I think we're about out of time. I thank you so much, Marilyn, for sharing all your knowledge. This was really yeah. fascinating. Good. And I'll let you sign thank off. Okay. And I will send the email out with all the reference if you want to read more. All righty. Thank you, everybody.